Voice Ed Radio. Your voice is right here. And welcome to another episode of In Conversation with me, Stephen Hurley on Voice Ed Radio. So earlier this year, the Ontario government announced several provocative, if not controversial, changes to the way that public education will be carried out in that province. So in addition to changes to mathematics curriculum, they were expected at the elementary level and larger class sizes, not so much. At the secondary levels, many were really surprised by an announcement that grade 9 to 12 students, high school students in the province of Ontario, would, beginning in the year 2020, be required to take at least four of their credits online. Not surprisingly, that announcement has opened up quite a bit of discussion here and elsewhere. Discussion on the hows, the whats, the wheres, and especially the whys of mandatory online learning for Ontario students. Helping us to wade into that conversation even deeper, we have with us this morning and pleased to have Michael Barber. He's an Associate Professor of Instructional Design for the College of Education and Health Sciences at Truro University in sunny California. But Michael has a long history, uh, not only here in Canada, but elsewhere uh, with online learning, having spent the last decade of his life really delving into what makes it work and what make it, makes it work well. He's one of the founding thinkers behind the development of the Can E Learn Network. It's a national not-for-profit with a vision to be the leading voice in Canada for learner success in K-12 online and blended learning. Michael Barber, welcome to Voice Ed Radio and In Conversation. Thank you for having me, Stephen. Well, that's a uh, rather long introduction, but there's I know there's much more to say, and I, w- I just wanted to give you a, a chance to uh, to maybe thicken that introduction up a little bit. Tell us about what you're really involved with now uh, in terms of e-learning, and uh, we'll jump off from there. Well, uh, I guess the first thing to say is my my even though I'm located in California, my interest in e-learning in Canada comes about because I'm originally from Newfoundland and began my teaching career in a small rural school in, in Newfoundland. Uh, small by most standards. It was actually large by Newfoundland standards. Um, and while I was at the school, I actually had the opportunity to both teach design courses and um, administer first a district-based um, online program that we were developing around advanced placement social studies courses. And then um, as that was in development in conjunction with a lot of other district programs throughout the province, uh, the ministry there decided to create a province-wide virtual school that I had the opportunity to be involved with for its first couple of years. Um, so that basically began, that was in the late 90s and began my interest in the uh, in, in the field, and I've been sort of researching it and, and teaching and designing courses and evaluating programs uh, really ever since. So it strikes me, Michael, that uh, the necessity of uh, looking at online learning uh, and the opportunity in, in rural Newfoundland especially is different than it might be in downtown Toronto. Was it, was it the, the geography of that place that, uh, that had people really interested in this? In the case of Newfoundland, and for that matter, a lot of Canadian provinces, distance education at the K-12 level, which eventually took the form of online or e-learning in modern years, really came about because of a desire to serve students in rural areas at a level that those who were attending larger schools that um, in urban areas could um, offer. You know, if I have uh, a school of a couple of thousand trying to drum up uh, 20 students or 25 students to get into a particular class is not as difficult as if I'm in a school of, say, 35, uh, trying to get, you know, the same interest in an advanced placement science course or a foreign language course that isn't French as a second language. And um, so online, op, you know, distance education, online learning offered opportunities for those types of students. Um, it's interesting because as we've seen the, the field develop now, um, over the last decade, it, it really has changed significantly, not just in Canada, but internationally as well, where we've seen in many cases, urban areas, particularly the, the, the inner city parts of urban areas, often have many of the same challenges that our rural schools have. You know, it's not because of a, a lack of students, but in many cases, it's because of 
a lack of opportunity that's provided to those students because uh, if I'm a highly specialized teacher, say, you know, I can teach Mandarin as an example that's often used in the United States or an advanced mm-hmm. placement physics class. Um, I can, you know, live and teach in the suburbs or I can teach in the inner city with all of that, you know, with all of the things that brings. And unfortunately, within our society, um, many of those highly specialized teachers have chosen to avoid uh, the inner city areas. So many of those students are running into the same of lack of opportunity that we see in our rural areas. So we've also seen online learning pick up predominantly in those areas in the past decade as well, which has really been sort of a fascinating and unintended development within the field. So within just a few minutes here this morning, you have uh, highlighted just how complex this conversation is and perhaps should be with all those subtleties and nuances uh, uh, brought forward. So I, I appreciate that. And and I'm thinking back to the last Friday of spring break this year uh, at the Ontario Science Centre here in, in Toronto. Uh, the Minister of Education makes the, those uh, several announcements. Uh, as I said at the outset, some of them were kind of expected and there were some surprises and boom, there she drops the information on us that uh, Ontario secondary st- students beginning in next year, 2020 actually, will be required, won't just be an option, they'll be required to take four of their high school credits online. When you, when you heard that announcement initially, what were your, what were your first thoughts? Um, well, my, I guess my first reaction was, why four? Um, hmm. You know, I've seen jurisdictions in the U.S., and at one point in time there were as many as almost a dozen states in the U.S. that have required online learning for graduation in most cases, they require a single course at some point in the high school career. Uh, there was one state, uh, Idaho, that uh, when they introduced their graduation requirement, they had required two courses, but they talked about the different modalities between the two courses, so to essentially expose students to a greater variety of options. Um, and then there are other states where uh, a course is defined rather loosely so that you could have a... A coherent and consistent online learning experience that's embedded into a existing course uh, that students can take. So when I looked at sort of the the field and how it's shaped up in North America, four did stand out a fair amount because, you know, while yes, there are four years of secondary school in Ontario and it works out to one every year, it, it did seem to be the anomaly for jurisdictions that had done this. Uh, the other part of the announcement related to e-learning that you didn't mention was they also talked about centralizing the system, right? Um, which was something else that actually that piqued my interest a little bit more, both because Ontario actually has a fairly centralized system when it comes to e-learning uh, to begin with. And the second was because the trend that um, I've seen over the past, I guess, decade, a little bit better than a decade, um, throughout Canada is a decentralization of online or distance learning across the country. And when I look back at uh, the state of the nation, K-12 e-learning in Canada reports that we've done, and we're just getting ready to start the data collection on our 12th one now, um, I can't think of another jurisdiction that has gone through a process where they've centralized the e-learning environment um, Whereas I can describe three or four in great detail where they've continually decentralized the environment. So that was that actually occupied a little bit more of my own sort of interest than than the, the graduation requirement did, although it seems the graduation requirement is what's caught the public's attention. Well, I think um, both of those uh, announcements, when you put them together, uh, they can they can pull focus uh, off what I would re- really like to talk to you about because uh, people are trying to get at the reasons why uh, th- this announcement was made or these announcements were made. Is it a cost uh, savings uh, measure? Is it a move to privatize uh, some of our public system? Um, and so those those uh, as we said off air, those conversations are swirling around there on social media. But I, but I wanted to dig a little bit deeper into 
uh, the idea that if this is going to happen, how can we make it happen uh, at an optimal level? And what can we uh, draw on in terms of, of your research and, and your knowledge base uh, to help us maybe make this, make the best of it, if you will? Uh, could you, maybe we could begin by just delineating the difference between online learning and blended learning, because some of our listeners may not be familiar with that difference. Okay. Um, actually, before I get to that, one of the things I do want to say is that those sort of doomsday conversations that are happening, it's entirely possible that when this all comes to pass and is fully implemented, that some of those folks may have been you know, be proven to be prophets. Um, when we look at the, the literature and the practice of some of these actions, particularly in the United States, many of the things that folks are concerned about, they are right to be concerned about and right to ask questions about. The difficulty is at this stage, we basically have one or two sentences that says that there's going to be four required online courses and it's going to start by this date and we don't know anything else about it. So to your other question, I think this is an important aspect because without knowing any of the details, and my guess is that right now the, the government is still trying to figure out how mm -hmm. to go about doing this. It gives stakeholders a real opportunity to talk about what does this look like in an effective fashion. Um, and the first, you know, to your specific question, um, e-learning or online learning, there is a physical distance between the subject matter teacher um, and the student. Now, that distance can be geographic, it can be in time, or it can be um, based upon pace. So as an example, you could have an online course or an e-learning course where um, I'm located teaching the course in Toronto, but I've got students in Kingston and Windsor and Thunder Bay and Ottawa and so on. Mm -hmm. you know, so we're separated by distance. Um, you could also have a case where I'm sitting in a school in Toronto and I'm scheduled to teach 18 students or 27 students this particular subject, but three of them show up into my room in the first block and another six show up in the second block and another nine show up into the third block and then the other 12 show up into the fourth block. And while they're in the room sitting on their computers taking the e-learning that I've created for them, I'm in front of the room teaching something else. So we're not physically separated by geography, but we're separated by time. Um, so the time that they take their course isn't the same time that I teach the course. And I've seen both of those models that have been implemented, uh, not just in Ontario, but internationally. Um, and when done right, they can be quite successful. Now, blended learning, on the other hand, is where the subject matter teacher is in the room with the students while the students are engaged in their learning. And they are using online tools some of the time and face-to-face -face tools other times. And it's, it's kind of unfortunate that we've really given that a term blended learning. It's a term that came out of the U.S. and it's really gotten tied up into more of a corporate driven kind of learning where you have these larger ed tech corporations that are pushing it because the description I've just given you, if you remove the word online from it, basically I've just described technology integration to you. Right. And really blended learning is just technology. It's, it's good technology integration. Just the technology happens to be online in some fashion. So I'm going to go out on a limb and make the assumption that, uh, in the case of the Ontario government, they are not talking about a blended learning environment, but an online learning environment. Yes. Uh, uh, when they use the term e-learning in Ontario, they're specifically looking at that, which has a distance between, um, the student and teacher by geography or by time. Um, and for a long time now, the ministry is actually, as part of the e-learning unit, has had a mandate to try to increase the amount of blended learning that's happening throughout the province by leveraging the tools that they've designed for the distance side of things, but allowing classroom teachers to, to use those and classroom students to use those. And, and they've had great success with that as well. And so when we've talked over the past few months to, uh, to educators and even to parents about, uh, about those optimal conditions that would make this work, they've, they've always uh, brought in the importance of the human interaction. If you're, if you're going to uh, 
require that students take a, a course online, let's say every year in their high school career, uh, if it works out that way, uh, that they still have the opportunity to interact with uh, adults or a, a, an educator in that in the context of that course. We lose that opportunity when it's a when it is an online learning course and. Or do Actually, we? I'm, I was going to say, I'm going to stop you there because okay. we don't. In most of the well-designed online environments that we see in Ontario, uh, across Canada and internationally, um, the idea that a child is sitting in a room by themselves in front of a computer and not interacting with an adult in any fashion is just a myth. Um, it, in all honesty, is, uh, I would go as far as saying a scare tactic in many mm. of these conversations. Um, in a well-designed environment, and there are different models that you'll see uh, used in this, and we've actually posted a couple of blog entries on the Canadian eLearning Network's website that talks about you know, what this really looks like. But for almost 15 years now, we've had this model where the content expert, so say the, the Mandarin teacher or the physics teacher or the history teacher that's teaching online, they may not be in the room with the, with the students. In fact, in 99% of the case, they're not, unless they may have a couple of students from their own school that happen to be enrolled in their online course with students from you know, a dozen other schools. At the other schools, what should be happening is those folks should have some kind of educator in the room that is providing school-based support to them. Now, they don't have to be a math teacher like their online teacher. In fact, most would argue that it's probably best that they're not, because if they are, the students in the room are going to turn to the online, to their, their in-person teacher for help, and that increases mm. their load. Mm -hmm. But what they are is they're trained educators that know how students learn, that can help them develop the independent learning skills that they need on an individual basis to be successful in this environment. They can provide some of the technical troubleshooting that needs to happen there because they can be trained to do that. Or you could have multiple people that are responsible for that. Um, and, you know, I was a social studies teacher. So if I had a student in my room and I would say, and they give these people different terms, some of them are called facilitators, some of them are called mentors, some of them are called mediating teachers. Uh, in New Zealand, they use the term e-dean. Um, but if I'm one of these school-based people as a social studies teacher and, and I've got a student there that's taking grade 12 math, oh, you know, it, it's been over 20 years since I, over 25 years now since I've taken grade five math or grade 12 math. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know how to, you know, look at it and give them the answer, but I can probably with the student and with what they've learned up until that point, the two of us can kind of muddle our way through and find the answer. And that kind of problem solving that I've just exposed the student to and the critical thinking that I've gone through to try to go through those steps as a non-subject area teacher is invaluable for the student in terms of going forward if they're able to continue to do the types of things that I model. Um, you know, so just in that kind of environment alone, there should be a teacher in the room. Actually, legally speaking, you know, within North America, we, we've got this notion of in loco parenthesis, which schools have to follow, um, mm -hmm. roughly translates into in place of the prudent parent. You know, you would not, a prudent parent would not send their child into an empty room or into a room with 20 other kids by themselves unsupervised to, you know, for an hour, 75 minutes, 90 minutes at a time and to expect them to learn in that environment. And in much the same way that an, a prudent parent wouldn't expect it. The education doesn't expect it. Uh, the education system, sorry. Even if you look at the the, the agreements that um, the districts, the school boards have to agree to to participate in the e-learning Ontario system, so to get access to the content, to get access to the learning management system, uh, desire to learn or bright space, they have to agree to do certain things, and some of those things, including providing that local level of support. Now, whether or not the schools are actually following through on that commitment is something that you know parents could and should investigate, but they're supposed to do it. By law, they're supposed to do it. They're telling the ministry that they're doing it. 
Um, you know, so these are some of the things that we should expect. And the research has shown us very clearly that the presence of an active and trained facilitator or mentor at the local school level has a significant impact on both retention and success of a student in the online learning environment. So you know, that, and that's just one yeah. example of something that we want to make sure was a part of this system. Yeah, well, I'm glad you painted that picture, Michael, because I'm I'm thinking that there may be some, and my, myself included, who when they first heard the announcement, pictured kids sitting at home in their bedrooms, you know, at at ten o'clock at night or in a coffee shop, uh, kind of on their own uh, taking this course. But uh, that condition of adult presence, uh, I think, is is really really important. And I'm glad you highlighted that. And, and it's important to know that it is part of the e-learning system because during the conversations, a lot of people do believe that e-learning means independent study. They're thinking of the old correspondence model where we mailed packets back and forth. Just what does that look like on the internet now? This you know, That scenario that I just described wouldn't be considered blended learning because the subject area teacher is f- distant from the student. In that case I gave, it was a physical distance. Um, you know, so it, it's important to know that that is e-learning. That's not blended learning. So is there a, a jurisdiction in Canada where this is happening really well? It, it's, it's really coming together? Um, e-learning in general or a mandated just, just, requirement? Just that, well, no, I, I guess that, that uh, you know, that, that online learning with an adult in the room, not necessarily the subject matter uh, expert. Can you point to some places where this is happening well? Um, well, one area I think, and I, I always like to brag about my home province when I get the opportunity to, so uh, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Um, when the provincial government in Newfoundland created their Centre for Distance Learning and Innovation, which is essentially their version of e-learning Ontario, uh, it's a centralized, essentially province-wide virtual school, for lack of a better term, Um Part of that was they actually set up the system in such a way that it required um, schools to designate, in the first couple of years, they called it a mediating teacher. Mm -hmm. Um, After about three or four years, as the system started to uh, iron out its kinks and and develop, and we started to see exactly what was required of this role, they changed it to a mediating team. And even within that team, you know, there's a, a technical person, an administrative person, and then what they call a coach which is sort of that soft skills, supervisory kind of person. And in many of our rural schools, all three of these roles are performed by the same individual because they just don't have the the staff to do it. Um, But it's always been a condition of the participation in the program. And because many of these rural schools are so small and um, so short-staffed, it's been something that... Um, really has needed to come about in order for these students to have success in this environment. Now, the small school aspect, obviously, is something that can't be replicated in a lot of provinces um, because Newfoundland is a a jurisdiction where half of the schools have less than 200 kids in them, and I think it's 25% have less than 50 kids. Uh, So that kind of, of necessity isn't necessarily present throughout pretty much all of Ontario. Uh, But the model that they've developed is one that could be there. In fact, as a part of the um, Teacher Allocation Commission that was developed back in, I think it was 2006 or so, they actually even recognized this as part of the allocation and recommended that for every school that had so many students that they should be allocated a unit towards this e-learning support. Now, that unfortunately, that recommendation was never actually implemented. Um, but, you know, we have the basis of a model there. It's just having the the funding and the political will in order to put it in place. So if you look at the province of Ontario, and it's it's big, and there are, there are still many uh, non-urban, I'm going to say non-urban because I can't say the r- word rural <laughs> as well as you can, uh, locations, do we need, are there hidden costs uh, maybe that we're not talking about in terms of the infrastructure and in terms of uh, the uh, the hardware that needs to be in place? Because in, in the province has also, uh, you know, ha, uh, instituted that controversial, uh, interesting ban on cell phones. Uh, if you're saying, okay, students can't bring their own technology, 
Uh, do we have to invest in, in more technology to make this work uh, according to that model? Yes, definitely. Um, you know, first, when you're looking at just cost, I mean, first, you've got the cost of the actual online teachers. So let's say that the government's program or proposed, you know, 35 student class limits that they've imposed for that they've proposed for online classes or for e-learning classes goes through. You know, so for every 35 students that are actually enrolled in an online environment, you've got, um, you know, one teaching unit divided by however many periods that that teacher is, is supposed to teach. Then you've got the cost of providing that facilitator at the local level. And in some cases, that might be a cost savings because you've got, you know, if you've got a computer lab of 40 kids in there and all you're doing is supporting soft skills and supervisory type things, you could probably have one teacher doing that because the actual content-based instruction is happening by somebody else. But there's also going to be some of your smaller schools throughout the, 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 the province and, and even some of the larger schools just at certain time blocks throughout the day that are less popular where you might have someone that's tied up doing this local school level and there's only 10 kids in the room or five kids in the room. Mm -hmm. So there's that cost. Um, in the case of, of Newfoundland, when they started doing this, one of the first things that they did was they explored how they could provide high-speed internet to all the schools. I remember the first couple of years, we literally had satellite dishes on the top of some of these rural schools. And um, because it was dealing with a satellite that most of the uh, eastern seaboard uh, worked off of, basically our internet ran well until about 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning. And then when everyone in the eastern seaboard woke up, then all of a sudden the, the bandwidth dropped off significantly. Um, the province and particularly the, the school boards engaged in a number of federal initiatives to try to get fiber dropped through some of the rural parts of the province. And ironically, at one point in time, Labrador was actually one of the best wired parts of the entire province because they had been involved in some of these federal initiatives to get the bandwidth put in these. But that's a big issue for a lot of our uh, rural schools. I, I look at in Ontario as an example, there's a an aboriginally focused program called Kiwaitin Internet High School mm -hmm. that uh, works up in northern Ontario and about half of the schools that they engage with are flying communities. Uh, these folks don't have a fiber line running right through them. Um, and while they've been able to make it work through other means, making it work is not good enough if you're going to mandate or require online learning to happen. Uh, the ministry, in, in the case of Newfoundland, also purchased computers. They purchased polycom units. They purchased printers. Um, it seems an endless number of headsets because the kids kept breaking those things, um, you know, and outfitted all of the schools that were participating in this program with this for two reasons. A, because many of the schools didn't have that level of technology. Um, B, because then whenever a school or a kid or a, a local teacher had a problem with the technology, the folks in St. John's who were trying to figure out how to fix it knew exactly what they were using because it was the exact same system that they had sent them. Um, and then the third is that when it came to the, um, the actual instruction and the instructional design and the pedagogy, teachers were able to experiment with different tools and with different strategies because they knew that all of the machines throughout the system were able to run that technology and that based on the bandwidth that had been established throughout the province, that the students would be able to access those things. So there's to do this right, and, and that's the key. I mean, to say that we want four courses that are required to be taken in an e-learning environment in order to graduate, fine. If, if that's what they want, then that's what they're going to push through. Then the question becomes, how can we do it in such a way where it doesn't impact upon the graduation rate, that we don't have students not graduating just because of this requirement? And it's that part of the conversation that I don't think that we've actually had much of as I've been engaging with folks throughout the province. And um, you know, those costs are the big aspect of it. If we're going to do this and if we're going to do this so that these students have the opportunity to have success, it's going to cost money. 
which seems to run counter uh, to this uh, current government's uh, commitment to save money. And that's why I think it's really, really important that that people hear this and listen to it. And not only uh, not only people that you know might might have children in the system, but our politicians and and right up to the policy level. I think it's it's really important to access the knowledge that you have and the research that you've done. Uh, and, you know, we haven't even talked about uh, some of the other equity issues around uh, access and, and uh, students with special needs, uh, students from, uh, you know, from, from different contexts that, uh, that might not have access uh, to this in the same way. Sometimes when you live in Toronto or even the GTA, uh, the greater Toronto area, you, you, you assume that the whole province uh, thinks and acts and has access to the same types of uh, of things. Uh, so I it's appreciate- It's interesting you mentioned the, the special ed students. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah but, no, go ahead. Um, when we look at actually the online learning graduation requirements that currently exist in the U.S., it's interesting that several of them actually have built into the policy that students that have IEPs can be exempted from that particular uh, requirement. Not that it's an automatic thing, but based upon the specific nature of the student's IEP, if this is something that would pose an impediment to the student graduating, they can actually be uh, have this particular requirement excluded from their list of requirements. This could be something that this particular government is going to implement. We don't know because we have really no details on how this is going to unfold. Um, you know, so there's a lot of things that, you know, when we talk about, well, what about this group of students and what about this particular area and what about the problem at this stage, I think, is that we don't have much in the way of information because e-learning and, and you know, online learning, it's just a modality. Mm-hmm. It's a medium that we use to provide instruction in much the same way that the classroom is a medium that we use to provide instruction for the people that are listening to this a particular podcast. It's a medium that they're hopefully learning something from, so it's a medium of instruction. Mediums aren't good or bad. Mediums aren't effective or ineffective in and of themselves. It's how we use them and the way in which they're supported on the learner side. Uh, there's a sort of a infamous uh, piece that uh, was written by a, a California-based professor back in the 1980s, a guy by the name of Richard Clark, who in an article in the Review of Educational Research basically said that media or technology impact learning the same way that the delivery truck affects the nutritional value of the groceries that it carries. Hmm. You know, it's a delivery vehicle in much the same way that online learning is a delivery vehicle and that it's uh, his argument and it's really been the dominant view in the field ever since. And for that matter, well before, he just sort of coined a nice way of saying it, um, you know, is that it's the way in which we design, deliver and support that learning, regardless of medium, that's going to have a difference. Well, I'd like to go back to that statement, maybe in another conversation, and unpack that a little bit because uh, initially it's it sounds good, but I'm wondering. Well, I I just want to talk about that more. You've you've uh, you've uh, flipped a philosophical switch in my mind this morning. I've talked myself into a second interview. <laughs> there you go, a conversation, not an interview, but a conversation. Uh, yes. But, you know, as a, as a researcher and someone that's been immersed in this for so many years, uh, when you look at what we're talking about and you look at what researchers are talking about, uh, is there a gap that needs to be bridged? Are we? Uh, are you talking about things differently than the general public is? And if so. What things need to enter into our conversation? Well, first, I'll I'll be the first to admit that we don't have enough research out there on this topic. Um, When we look at the Canadian context, at present, there is somewhere in the vicinity of anywhere from two and a half to four percent of all K twelve students that are taking that will have taken one or more courses in a distance format, online or otherwise. By the time they graduate, when you're looking at the U.S., it's two to three percent. So in terms of the overall education system, the number of students engaged in this is is quite small, although growing and mandates like the one that's been proposed in Ontario help that growth. Um, 
not necessarily saying that that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it just you know increases the numbers. Um, right now in the field, there may be 20 researchers that are actively doing research into any number of issues that we see in the K-12 online and blended environment. And unfortunately, 20 just in all honesty isn't enough. There's you know only two or three of us that are doing any work in Canada anymore on this. There used to be like a half a dozen of them or more that were based at Memorial University. But unfortunately, they've all retired to, well, I guess not unfortunate for them, but unfortunate for us, they've all retired and, and aren't working in the field anymore. But um, so what we have in all honesty is we don't have best practices or principles, or I can sit here and tell you, these are the things that need to happen in order for this to be successful. I can tell you that based upon these isolated case studies, some of which, you know, may be better than others, some of which may be multi-year and multi-site, but some of which are, uh, only based upon a single school year and a, a few dozen students, um, in a single district, in a single online program. And while we can learn some things from that, and while they can give us some directions in which we can point folks to, some starting points, if you will, on how to go about doing this right, they don't result in conclusive results. So if I were to do a, a you know study with students up in, say, um, well, for six years while I was working at Wayne State University, I lived down in Windsor. So if I was to do uh, a study with the, the Windsor-Essex School Board down there and looking at their distance program and the less than 100 students that are engaged in that and looking at them over the course of a school year, the things that I learned there, while I might be able to provide some tips for Windsor-Essex for how to do things similarly or differently next year, that shouldn't form the basis of this is what the problem should do or that we shouldn't do this because of the experience that I just found in, in Windsor, Essex. Um, and unfortunately, that's oftentimes what we're seeing in the research is we're taking these isolated case studies and we're extrapolating them to the entire population mm -hmm. uh, in a province. And, and so um, there are a lot of questions that we've got out there. Um, and right now, unfortunately, there's not enough people to be working on them because we could be doing this so much better. I mean, there are instances and, and they're isolated. Uh, I'll be honest with you there throughout Canada and throughout uh, North America where we see good programs doing good things that are servicing specific populations of students in ways that the physical or brick and mortar environment can't. The question is, is how do we learn the lessons from these isolated instances so that we can make that the norm and not the exception? And I think, how do we stay curious as well in all of that? And I can only imagine as a researcher, your your um, your eyes must have lit up when you heard the Ontario announcement, because now you have a whole very large context in which to uh, to ask some of those questions. Yes. Uh, it'd be nice to have some answers before they do the implementation, but... <laughs> Well, okay, so it's a, it's a province-wide <laughs> pilot program. Take me to your pilot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's one of the, the difficulties we have. And Ontario isn't the only example of this. We've seen this time and time again where an individual school district might decide that we're going to go you know, full force into this and invest into it in a big way, or uh, a, a, a U.S. state decides they're going to require uh, you know, online learning in order to graduate, or they're going to make it so that um, every single school district has to provide distance education to their students, not necessarily that they have to take it. And then we start doing the research mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, starting to do the research in, in, um, and, and again, I'm not sure how you do this exactly, but, you know, trying to find some lessons from the, the research first and then implementing programs based upon those. And, um, it's a chicken and an egg kind of thing. Yeah. Although in all honesty, we've had chickens like this before, you know, this isn't the first distance ed type of program that's been implemented at the K-12 level, you know, while correspondence education only served a, a very small group of students in terms of the, the type of student that was going to have success in there. They, it does provide us with some lessons on, on what to do now. Um, you know, TVO has had a longstanding standing. Um, distance ed program 
you know, while instructional television isn't necessarily the, the way to go, there are lessons that we learned as a part of that model. Um, you know, so taking some of what we describe as those legacy technologies that we used for distance education in the past and trying to leverage some of those lessons today is something that, in all honesty, we haven't done a good job at, both on the practitioner side and in particular on the research side. You know, most of us in, in the field, when you read through these articles, uh, reports that are written and that kind of thing, the field begins in the, the early to mid 90s. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. We've been doing distance education at the K-12 level for over 100 years now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not like everything we learned in the first 90 were useless and it's only stuff we've learned in the last 25 that's applicable to today. In fact, some of the uh, the early distance education took place over the radio airwaves. And uh, uh, I think we, maybe we need to get back to that. The, the Midwest was uh, pioneers in those uh, that kind of medium. Australia was even still to this day has dozens of schools of the air that are operating using educational radio as their their medium for distance education there you go the future of voice ed radio right here right before your eyes developing as we speak uh ed, michael I, I love to ask the question uh a double question uh what's at stake what's in store what what is in store for us if we really embrace the curiosity, uh, look at this as an opportunity to do some, uh, some learning. Uh, what's in store for us at the other end of this? Well, I, I think a lot of it depends on just, you know, how this all shakes down in terms of the implementation. You know, there's really, right now, it, we're, we're kind of like in a Robert Frost poem. You know, two, mm -hmm. two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And, you know, we don't know which of the two roads we're going to, to follow upon. You know, we could follow up on the 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 cost cutting. E learning is a way to both decrease the a number of costs and to decrease the number of teachers. And you know, this becomes an abysmal failure. Um, and we've got a, an entire generation of students by the time we untangle ourselves from this mess that really have been shortchanged by the public education system. The other road takes us down a particular path where we are leveraging this particular tool and find that for certain populations of students, even ones that we didn't necessarily expect to begin with, are having opportunities to have success in this kind of environment that they didn't have in the face-to-face -face environment. You know, that's the other thing that I, I find very interesting about this. You know, we talk about, well, we shouldn't require all students to learn online. Well, we require all students to learn in the classroom. And even mm -hmm. under this mandate, still some, you know, 70, 80 percent of their learning will take place in the classroom. There are a lot of kids that we have in our system right now that don't learn well in a traditional face to face classroom. And yet we are requiring them to be there and still expecting them to learn in that way. This, if done well and done right, could provide us with an opportunity to actually serve those students, in some cases for the first time within a public education system. You know, so it's, it's really two very extremes. And um, in all likelihood, what's likely going to happen is we're going to end up beating a path through the woods instead of taking each of those roads and do something that's kind of in the middle. But, um, you know, we have to wait and see what the, the government's intentions are with implementing this before we know exactly how it's all going to shake out. Well, Michael Barber, I wanted to thank you. You've been very generous with your time. Uh, you've raised a, a number of points that I think we need to follow up on here including the fact that I thought it was two roads diverged in a snowy wood, but I realized that I'm confusing two Robert Frost poems. <laughs> I didn't realize it was a yellow wood. I wonder why. But uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, will you come Actually, back and talk to us? Uh, you may uh, be correct, to be honest with you. No, I don't think I am. I Googled okay. it. You are right. <laughs> you are absolutely right and i'm not going to edit that out just because uh i think it'll cause people to go and look at robert frost my guest today on in conversation michael barber associate professor of instructional design for the college of education and health sciences at turo university california but as you have heard a real passion for what's happening in ontario what's happening in canada and michael thanks so much for your expertise and your insight thank you for having me it was a great pleasure chatting 
You are listening to Voice Ed Radio. Your voice is right here. And for more great content, be sure to visit voiced.ca. There you'll find our latest blogs, podcasts, live broadcasts. But more important than any of that, an ongoing invitation for you to become part of this growing dynamic community of people who care about the conversations in education. I'm Stephen Hurley. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.